It's security to hold on to the mic. <laughs> Good morning. Okay. Good to see everyone. In our message this morning, I hope to answer four really important questions. Obviously not in detail, but I hope to give a sufficient answer for each of these. And these are really core questions for us as Christians. They're foundational questions. You can see them on the screen. What is, what is good news? Turn on any TV news station and you won't get any good news or hardly any. But the Bible is full of good news. What is good news? And then second, why is Jesus good news? Third, how can I better share his good news? And fourth, why do so many people reject good news? We'll come across the the answers to each of these as we work through the passage, uh, and I'll point out to you each time when we, when we answer one of these questions. Uh, the passage we're looking at is Luke chapter 4, and it's really the beginning of Jesus' ministry here on earth. Uh, in context, here, here's the passage. Uh, Luke chapter 4, verse 14 through 30. We'll cover all those verses, but some of them I won't say a whole lot about each, uh, but I'll include them here. I want to begin by talking about the context. It's so important to understand the bigger picture. So this is where we'll start uh, to this morning. Here's what's going on in the life of Jesus. Jesus has just spent 40 days fasting. Actually, I can't imagine 40 days of fasting. My opinion is that after the third or fourth day, everything you look at is going to look like food. <laughs> I mean, the doorknobs will look like a hamburger bun, you know, and everything that... Anyway, Jesus fasted for 40 days, prayed in the desert during that time, and overcame the enemy's effort to distract him and really do more than distract, to destroy the reason Jesus came. But his victory marks the beginning of his ministry. So we're going to pick up the passage in Luke chapter 4, verse 14. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. And a report about him went out through all the surrounding country. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. Do not overlook some really important words in the beginning of this passage. In the power of the Spirit, Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit. If you read through the whole Gospel of Luke, you will see that this is like a key phrase for the whole story of the life of Jesus as written by Luke, in Luke and also continuing into Acts. Jesus lived continually in the power of God's Spirit. And really, it's the only way you and I can live. The longer I'm, the longer I am, I, I became a Christian when I was 21, so I didn't start out as Christian. But the longer I am a Christian, the more I realize I've got to have God's power. I need desperately God's power to do what he wants me to do, to live how he wants me to live, to say what he wants me to say, to act as he wants me to act. 
Only in the power of God can we do what God wants us to do. It's the only way we can walk in victory. And we just read Romans 8 in our, in our um, uh, memory verse. Uh, and Romans 8 also talks about that. It's the power of God's Spirit that allows us to walk in victory. And Jesus returned out of the desert in the power of God's Spirit. It's the only way that a broken world can be touched. And, you know, before we go any further, I just want to pray this for us. So we'll do a prayer right here in the beginning of the message. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your call. Thank you for choosing us to be your children. Father, thank you for giving us the power to be the people you want us to be. Thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit in our lives. Thank you for the power to say yes to you. Thank you for the power to say no to temptation. Thank you for the power to love the people around us. Thank you for the power to shut our mouth when we shouldn't say what we're about to say. Thank you for the power to speak when we should speak. Thank you for your power in our lives so that we can be pleasing to you in every way, in every day. Lord, we pray because of Jesus. Amen. So Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit, 16 and 17. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. As was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. And we'll stop right there for a moment. You understand synagogue. Synagogue was the building in which the Jewish people would meet every week on Saturday to worship God and to study the scriptures. So they, uh, they had their regular meeting, and in comes Jesus. He was obviously still being led by the Spirit. He was in the right place at the right moment. It was not an accident or coincidence that he was in that synagogue on that day. It's his hometown. They knew him. He grew up there. But as we'll, we'll see in a few moments, the hometown was not really glad he was there. Uh, they were not saying, welcome home, Jesus. But anyway, Jesus went into the synagogue. He was invited to speak and they gave him the scriptures of, uh, from the prophet Isaiah. We'll continue here. And here is what Jesus read. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus just read from Isaiah chapter 61 and also chapter 58. These verses predict the work of Israel's Messiah. You understand Messiah? Messiah was the word that the, Israel, it, the Israeli people used to describe the coming deliverer from God, the coming king from God. Messiah and Christ 
anointed one, king, are all basically the same meaning. So in English, we, we say the Christ. The Jewish people would say the Messiah. The anointed one. The one God has chosen to be the answer the fulfillment of his promise for this world. The one God has chosen to bring good news to a world that was full of bad news. Let's look at each of these characteristics. So Jesus says, God's spirit is upon him. So he came out of the desert in the power of the spirit. He ended up in the synagogue, still in the power of the Spirit, but now he's reading these words from Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is on me, and he has anointed me to do what? To proclaim good news to the poor. Let's just talk about the poor. In that culture, in Jewish culture, the poor did not just mean a money issue. The people in Israeli society who were considered poor were known to be people who were humble. They were people who were in need and who recognized their need. So it wasn't just they had no money. It was a whole way. It was a kind of a, 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 a more than monetary. It was a condition of their heart that poor is describing here. These are words that go against their culture because most Jewish people in their culture believe that if you obey God, you will be rich, you will be blessed, you will have more, you will have an abundance. That was their perspective. So the poor were the ones that were not walking with God. The poor were the ones that were the outcasts. The poor were the ones that we ignore and leave behind or push to the side. And yet Jesus said God had anointed him to come and speak to the very people that society was overlooking. So right away these words... From Isaiah were radical words, and Jesus is going to make that point even more clearly in a moment. Uh, these are not the people that the Jewish society expected the Messiah to focus on. So the poor, humble, afflicted people who are needy, but who recognize their need for God. Liberty to the captives. refers to freedom for people captured by sin, captured into some kind of bondage. It can be captive to their own lifestyle or captive to their circumstances. It was people who were not able to live a life of freedom for whatever reason. Sight to the blind. We know that Jesus in his ministry opened the eyes of blind people several times, but it was more than just a physical eye opening. It was a heart eye opening. It pictured outwardly what Jesus was doing inwardly in people's lives. He was opening the eyes of their hearts to really see God by looking at him. And then the last one there, liberty to the oppressed. This refers to healing or peace for people who have been mistreated by society, mistreated by the government, treated unjustly, treated unfairly for whatever reason. So Jesus is coming to focus on a group of people that were the outcasts of society, basically. And then he says, maybe the most powerful part, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. It means the year or the time or the moment 
of God's salvation, the time of God's intervention, the moment when God would step down into this world and change everything. That's what he's saying, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This actually goes back to the Old Testament, and it refers to a Jewish festival that was practiced once every 50 years called Year of Jubilee. It was God's gift to Israel. It's found in Leviticus chapter 25. Every 50 years in Israelite society, all slaves would be set free. Everyone would have their debts canceled. So you owed money to so-and-so for buying an ox, debt canceled during the year of Jubilee. You sold yourself to be a, you know, when it says slave here, don't think of slavery like what we had in U.S. This is talking about slavery where people oftentimes would sell themselves as a slave, just like we sign a contract to do work for some company. Uh, a little bit different than that, but similar. So these were people that, okay, I have so many bills, I'll never pay them, so I'm going to sell myself to the farmer down the road, and I will work as his hired hand for 10 years so I can pay out my debts. That's the kind of slavery that they had in that time. But on, in the year of Jubilee, all that was canceled. Everybody was back to zero again. We actually proclaim this every time we pray. We prayed it this morning. Every time we pray the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. That goes back to the year of Jubilee. Only now it's, a, it's, a com, it's, a, it's not just once every 50 years. It's a lifestyle that we live. We think of the debts as debts of sin or mistreatment. Our Father, your kingdom come, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, deliver us from evil. All of that is the jubilee celebration. So God's favor, Jesus says, the year of the Lord's favor. Now, based on all that, let's go back to I don't know if this has a pointer. Anyway, let's go back to the verse 18 where it says to proclaim good news. So what is good news? Just based on what we've read here, it's the first question I said I would answer. What is the good news? The good news is God's message to the people who are needy. God's message to the people who are captive. The giving of sight to those who are blind. Freedom, the liberty for those who have been oppressed. The favor of the Lord. All of that is part of the good news. So what is the good news? The good news is the whole story of Jesus. I'm going to say it again because maybe you have to think about that. The good news is the whole story of Jesus. The good news didn't happen just at the moment Jesus died. The good news happened when Jesus was born. <laughs> the birth of Jesus is good news. The teaching of Jesus is good news. The miracles that Jesus did are good news. The life that Jesus lived is good news. The love that Jesus had for people is good news. You know, Jesus was often criticized because he was eating with people that were the, the poor, the outcasts, the, the rejected of society. That was good news. Jesus demonstrated the good news by having meals with people that other people rejected. The good news is Freedom from death. 
freedom from self. That's good news. His resurrection is good news. And of course, his death on, on Good Friday, coming up in, in just a few more weeks. His victory over Satan is good news. His ascension after resurrecting, where did Jesus go? Seated at the right hand of the Father, seated in the place of power to rule and to reign. That's good news. So what is good news? Good news is Jesus. And all that Jesus has done for us. And actually the word good news comes from the Old Testament. It was, it was, it's found in the book of Isaiah several times. So even predicting when Jesus would come in the Old Testament was described as good news. Second question, why is Jesus good news? Why is Jesus good news? Jesus said it this way, he is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. He was God's ordained way to resolve the problem Adam and Eve caused way back in the beginning. And I want to add this. The good news, why is Jesus good news? The good news is a relationship with Jesus. It's a relationship. We connect. The good news is never just a formula. It's a, it's a connection of our whole life with Jesus and our Father in heaven because of Jesus. Third, how, how can I better share his good news. Third question. Remember Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach, to share, to speak the good news to the poor. So we share the good news by, by asking God to fill us with his spirit and to walk in that reality. Last summer, we had a uh, Chinese uh, scholar here, and uh, we knew that she was open to learning more about what Christianity taught. And so Terry and I made a, an appointment with her to meet her at a coffee shop in Shorewood, and we were prepared to explain to her what it means to become a Christian. Well, as soon as we got to the coffee shop, she was there. I'm not giving her name. She was there. She's not in Milwaukee anymore. She uh, sat down at the table with us, and right away she said, I want to tell you I've become a Christian. And so we were like, wow, God, you're already way ahead of us in this. And so when we asked her to tell us what happened, she said, about 15 years ago, somebody in Beijing, a professor, while she was still a student, shared the good news with her. She said, but I didn't understand it. She said, yet all of these years I have thought about it and thought about it, and finally I understand. That's the power of God's word planted in a person's heart. It took a long time. It wasn't what we did. It was way back with the, with the professor sharing with her 15 some years ago, and it's what the Holy Spirit did in her life through that word. 
that brought the fruit. So how can I better share the good news by depending as much as possible on the, on the power of the Holy Spirit to speak through us, to live the, the Christian life through us, to work in that person's heart, to take the Word of God and make it real and meaningful and understandable. It's the work of God's Spirit. God wants people to be saved more than we ever could. So it's His work. We're the vessel. We're the instrument. We're often the voice, the, 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 the hands and feet of God extended, but it's His work. His Holy Spirit does the work. Okay, we'll continue here. Oh, those were the three. Oh, we answered three of them so far. We'll come to verse 20. And Jesus rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, and this is where he caused trouble. Today, this scripture You understand how what how powerful it was what what when Jesus said today this scripture is fulfilled in your midst today right now here this is reality the key word is today the jewish people believed that the messiah would come someday but those, that was a, you know, who knows when. But when Jesus said, today, it changed everything. It put a whole new understanding on those verses. The poor will hear the good news. The captives will be set free. When Jesus said, it's now, it's happening now, it's today. Now is the time for the power of sin to be broken. Now is the time for eyes to see God. Now is the time for God's plan of salvation to be fulfilled. Now the good news is being made known. It challenged everybody in that synagogue with just that one little statement. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Let's see what happens. And all who spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth, and they said, is this, is not this Joseph's son? Do you catch what's happening? They're not accepting what Jesus has just said. When Jesus said, today this scripture is being fulfilled, they're like, he's the son of Joseph. We saw him grow up. We saw him go to school. We saw him when he was a kid. How can he say that these verses, this promise from God in Isaiah is going to be happening right now? This was a, like, this was a challenge to their thinking. Is this, is not this Joseph's son? Isn't he just one of us? They were impressed by his words, but they were not convinced, and they were definitely not changed. Another verse, another version says, they were astonished at his words. They were surprised at his words. But isn't isn't this Joseph's son? It immediately expresses their doubt, their skepticism. We'll continue because it gets worse. But in truth, now, oh, I'm sorry, and he said to them, verse 23, doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you do, what we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. 
And he said, truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. Jesus knew when they said, aren't you just Joseph's son? He knew that they were skeptical. He knew their hearts. Jesus realized that these people astonished at his words were not accepting what he was saying. They were not believing. Verse 25. But in truth, Jesus continues. He says, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heavens were shut up three years and six months. And a great famine came over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. Seems like not that big of a deal, but it was a really big deal what Jesus just said because he's challenging their unbelief. He's saying, yeah, if you don't listen, God will go and send the message to someone else who will listen, and you won't be happy because that person is someone you've already rejected. But God has not. So Jesus is challenging their unbelief by reminding them of their own history. We'll continue. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elijah, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian, only Naaman the non-Jewish person. <laughs> So in my words, Jesus is saying, if you choose to reject the good news, if you choose to reject God's offer of salvation, I'll go to someone else who will welcome the message. Their response was less than positive, <laughs> to say it nicely. When they heard these things, all the synagogue were filled with wrath. And they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was. This is his hometown. This is Nazareth, right? So that they could throw him down from the cliff. They were already prepared to kill the good news because for them they didn't see it as good news and they wanted to kill Jesus right at that moment you know wow welcome home Jesus come over to the cliff and this brings us to our fourth question why do so many people reject good news? Just think about this for a moment. They're listening to Jesus. And they're rejecting the message. Even Jesus himself could not reach them, at least at that moment. And I thought about... What response would I have made if I was in that synagogue? <laughs> would I have said, yeah, Jesus, go, go for it. Tell him, tell him. Probably not. <laughs> I probably would have been with the rest of the crowd and saying, let's get rid of this guy. He's dangerous. He's trouble. He's going to, he's, he's, he's saying things that are totally opposite of what we think. Would I have rejected this son of Joseph? Sometimes you hear the phrase, except for the grace of God, there go I. Only because of God's grace. <laughs> or we'd be in the same category. So why do so many people reject the good news? Because it's contrary to what they think. It's contrary to their lifestyle. It's contrary to what they want. It's contrary to what they're living for. It's contrary to something or everything. 
in their life. And our part, pray. God, only your spirit can reach them. Only your spirit can open their heart. Only you, God, can change their desire. Only you can give them understanding. God, I can't do it. It's, it's outside of my ability. Only you can break through blinded eyes. Only you, God, can break through a heart of unbelief. But Jesus said, this is the year of the Lord's favor. It's the year of God's grace. It's the year of God's effort to reach those who are lost. Thank God for that. In just a moment, we're going to, I'm going to have a stand. I'm sure there's a family member, a neighbor, a co-worker, student, somebody you know who needs Jesus. Maybe you shared with them and they've rejected. Maybe you have not yet had opportunity to share with them. Let's pray and ask God, God, show them your favor. Here's the, the last verse I'm showing. Maybe it's the saddest verse in all the Bible. But passing through their midst, he went away. He didn't fight them. He didn't argue with them. He did even more. <laughs> to say he did even worse. He went away. He gave them what they asked for. He went away. Let's pray. Let's stand together and let's pray. Jesus, don't go away. Please, Jesus. Father, we come before you because of Jesus. Because Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the good news. Father, we're standing this morning representing family members and friends, co-workers, neighbors, students who need you. Father, only you can give them a heart. Only you can help them to see the good news, to understand the good news. Father, by your word, touch their hearts. By your spirit, soften their hearts. Father God, bring salvation to those who don't know. Bring salvation to those who are lost and don't even realize it. Bring salvation to those who have So many other things to think about that they don't even give time to you. Father, by your spirit, work in us. By your spirit, work deeper in us. May we be the good news this world needs. May we speak your words in a way that will touch hearts. May your spirit work through us to touch the people around us, God. Help the world around us to know real good news. And we pray this, Jesus, in agreement with God's will, God's heart, and in agreement with all you came to do and are doing here on this earth. Amen. Amen.